Well, we certainly appreciate your presence today on this last Sunday in 2018 to come and thank the Lord for his many blessings and supplying all of our needs and many of our wants. And as we look forward to the year of 2019, to pray that the Lord would bless us and give us a wonderful year. We're looking for a good time in 2019. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the blessings of the Lord to fall upon us and uh, see a growth in our church. And we hope that you are feeling that way and you'll invite people and to come and join with us as we worship the Lord together. Uh, so for our call to worship this morning, let's join together in singing hymn number 223. For all those that can and will, please stand as we sing all four stanzas of Standing on the Promises. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and Heavenly Father, we just approach your throne this morning with humble hearts. This morning we praise you, Lord, for your many, many blessings that you bestow upon us and for all the love and mercy and grace that you've shown us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, a special prayer for all the ones that are 
not able to be with us this morning due to illness or due to traveling or whatever, Lord. We just pray that you will uh, uh, take care of them and uh, bring them back at the next point in time. We pray for the requests on each heart that's here this morning. I know there's some heavy hearts here this morning, Lord, that uh, need your touch, Lord God, and we know that we can do nothing without you. You are the reason for the season, no matter what the season, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Lord, now we pray that you'll go with us through the remainder of the service and help us, Lord God, to just have peace that only comes from you. And help us, Lord, to let your light shine so that others might see you in us, Lord. Not that we should gain anything from it, but that you should receive the glory. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. See, it's great to be in God's house. Are you glad you're here this morning? Oh, you can do better than that. Are you glad you're here this morning? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'm glad we're here. It's good to see your smiling faces. It's good to be with the family of God today. <clears throat> Let me say thank you quickly for your love, your gift, your cards, your calls, your visits, uh, all the expressions of love that you gave Sandy and I over this past year, and especially this Christmas season. We're undeserving of such great love, but thank God that we're part of the family of God here at Woodland Heights and just God using you in our lives and we need you badly there. So thank you so much for all that you do and have done and are going to do in the coming future. It's good to be in God's house this morning and I trust that it's well with our soul. Enjoy the choir now as they come to sing. It is well with my soul. <coughs>
number 98. Hymn number 98 as we stand and sing together all three stanzas. Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the nearest that Jesus loves me. This being the last Sunday of the year, I thought I would take a moment and share with you my feelings of this past year. Year 2018, for many in this church, has been a trying year. For the church, it's been a trying year. And yet, it's been a year of miracles. A year of miracles. Maybe not miracles as you see demonstrated on TV. But we're living in a life of miracles. There's been many of the members of this church, people of this church in hospitals. Many have had illnesses that have kept them away from church. As I know you would love to have been here. But God has worked miracles. And some of you are here today 
as living proof of those miracles that he's worked this year in your life. Earlier in the year when I was planning brain surgery, not knowing, not knowing all that was going to happen, not just to me, but to the church, I asked the church just to step back and to see where God was working. And God has been very busy working in our lives. For the fear of missing someone by calling them by names, I'm not going to mention names this morning. I just want to mention some things that have happened. You'll recognize most of them. There have been people who've had heart problems, intestinal problems, intestinal surgeries. Some of you have been in car wrecks. Some of you have taken falls that could have easily taken you to heaven. There's been back issues. There's been balance problems. There's been eye problems for several folks. And then there's been brain and other several surgeries that you've had. There have been some in the hospital for many days and some for a short while, but we are still here by God's grace and God has only taken from our midst Brother Herman Hopkins whose job was finished after many years of faithful service to this church, to God, to you, the people of this church. And I'm certain he was very glad to hear the Savior say and welcome him to heaven. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. So the rest of us being here, I take it that he has much more for us to do as a church. And folks, I am very excited to see what God is going to use this church, not this building, but this body to do in 2019 and beyond. Many of you have stepped up and done more than you were already doing. Most all of you have stepped up and filled in where, they, where others could not. You served others even when you yourself was not feeling well. And you certainly have been there for Sandy and I. And those of you who could not do these things have been prayer warriors, which we badly need, greatly need, and still do. You say, Pastor, what can I do in the church? Pray. Pray one for another. Pray for its ministries. Lift this church, your pastor, the ministries here up to God daily. It's been that way all year long. People stepping up and doing things. But I thought about Christmas just to, make an, just to take it as an example of the way things has happened all year long. I looked at Christmas, the hanging of the green service the lighting of the candle services and the, and the cantata. Many of you worked hard on these services. Many of you took parts and basically the entire church got involved. I love our hanging of the green service where everybody, members and visitors can get involved and decorate the house of God and we can learn why we do what we do at Christmas time. Many people took part in readings and, and in, the, in the entire program, and the lighting of the candle service, and the cantata, which I believe the cantata was the best that we've had since I've been here. Church, family, you've done a great job. As a pastor, it makes me feel very proud that God has placed Sandy and I here to serve you, to serve with you, to serve you. And I'm proud with a heart overflowing with gratitude and thankfulness for each one of you that he has placed here for us to serve. And church, I love you and I am proud to be your pastor of every one of you. So let's 
Let me just say thank you, church, for your faithfulness to God and to this church and one to another. And let us thank God for his faithfulness and his grace. Thank you. And to God be the glory, great things he has done. If you begin to get a little discouraged, and we all do, from the pulpit to the back door, let's just go back and remember when that one sitting beside you or that other member was in the hospital for 20, 30 days, nursing homes, surgeries. You think God's not working? We're here, aren't we? God's working but I think he's only begun to work through us. So let's just take a moment and give God praise for all he's done and all he's going to do. And I hope you're as excited as I am to see what he has in store for us in the coming years because I'm overwhelmed with excitement. I might not show it, but I am. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Let's just take a moment and give him a round of applause for all he's done and all he's going to do. Thank you, church. God is faithful. God is so faithful. Sometimes I I know he's better to me than I am to him, and I don't deserve all of his goodness, neither do any of us. But it's been a year of miracles. I'm going to preach next Sunday, the Sunday morning message on the crowning touch of God. I'm going to show you what I believe he's got ahead of us. But God's done great things. He's doing great things. And he's not going to stop. So let's just get in there with him and work as hard as we can continually for his glory. And to God be the glory, great things he has done. We've got a lot to be thankful for because the good Lord lives in us. Well, I'm not myself.
one of the trios. Because he lives in me, in us, there's a place prepared for us in heaven. Looking forward to going there one of these days because he's been so faithful to us. For many people, Christmas is over. Celebrations of Christmas is over. But I personally believe that we never should quit celebrating the birth of Christ. We could preach it all year long and never consume or never exhaust the volume of teaching in the, Old, in the Old and New Testament concerning the birth of Christ. Look with me today in Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into, the, into, into uh, Judea, into the house of, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. 
And so when it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she, felt, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, I beho for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is, is born this day in the city of David, a, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you that ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away into, into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go even now into Bethlehem and see this thing which, is, which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known the broad the sayings which was told to them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept those things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that he had heard and seen as it was told to them. Heavenly Father, thank you for the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate, not just once a year, but daily his birth. Not only that, but the difference he's made in our life with the new birth, and all that he does daily for us. Father, this is the greatest story that man has ever heard, that God became man and dwelt with us, lived and died for us. But Lord, he's coming again. Thank you, Father, Lord, as we look into this story. Would you fill our hearts? Would you touch us this morning that we might glorify you and understand more about the birth of our Savior? In Christ's name. Amen. One writer put it this way, which I believe is very true. The birth of Christ was a supreme birth amidst things ajar. A wicked world. A dirty, filthy world. The light of the world was born at night. You see, he said, I am the light of the world. Now he says, we are the light of the world. But I'm so thankful that God's light came into this dark world. The prophet said, those who sit in darkness saw a great light. Naturally and spiritually, the world at that time was wrapped in hopeless and helpless darkness. The cold, chilly mix of form and religious ceremonies are now about to melt away and fade away before the warmth of his brightness and his birth. Thank God that the light, that Christ came as light, not lightning. I'm so thankful for God's love that he sent the light of the world instead of lightning to take us out, to destroy the world. But he sent Christ. I want us to notice the preparation that was made for his birth. Verses 1 and 5 through 5. And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee into the city of Nazareth into the, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed by Mary, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, who being great with child. J 
Joseph and Mary were traveling to Bethlehem not by accident. You see, I believe everything that happened in the birth of Christ was on purpose. It was designed by God. May I say it was designed by Christ himself. So Mary and Joseph with their unborn child traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem was no accident. The taxing of all the people by Serenus was no accident. It was all in the handwork of God. You see, Micah had the prophet had foretold that the king of Israel was to be born in Bethlehem. You find in Micah 5 2, but thou Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old and from everlasting. You see, I believe Christ always has been. He wasn't just born that winter night. He wasn't just born then. He always has been. He was God just as much as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit was God. God the, the, the Son is God. You can find many instances in the Old Testament of the pre-incarnation of Christ visiting the nation of Israel. So somewhere in the eons of times past, because God loved us and Christ loved his Father and was obedient to him, it was decided that he would be born of a virgin coming to this world in poverty. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So it was no accident. He was from old and he is everlasting. My God is an everlasting God. The decree of the Roman emperor helped fulfill God's word. You see, the emperor was interested in money, in gaining wealth for the treasury of the Romans. So he taxed the Jews. That was no accident. It was all predetermined by God. The city of his birth, the city of Christ's birth, the means of getting him there, the reasons that he went was all predetermined by God. Little do we know that the affairs of this world, who we think may be hindering the church, the politics of America who we think may be hindering the church, the work of liberal government, both nationally, statewide, and local, who we think may be hindering the church, may be in truth advancing the church, may be in truth in, in, in enabling us or enabling us to do more for God than we've been doing. So when we find things happening that we think is against God and we think against the church, let's look a little deeper because God has great reasons for what's happening. Just as if, just as though the Jews would be taxed and had to come to Bethlehem or the city of their birth and, or their or their heritage, just as that advanced and aided the birth of Christ, so may the circumstances of this world be aiding the church as we serve God. Because the circumstances of the church is in the hand of God as well as our souls. Let's not get discouraged and let's not get down when things of the world look so bad, but let's just keep going on because God is in control. God has all things planned. He has worked out. And I'm so thankful I have a God that's everlasting, who knows everything from the beginning, and nothing takes him by surprise. If you know my God, give him praise and glory. Yeah. <coughs> the 
Let's look a little bit further at his arrival in verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there were no room for them in the end. No room? Not just one room? No room in the end? There were many inns that day, many places to stay, but there was no room for Christ. And it's very prophetic of his birth, how the, how the reception would be to him being our Savior. No room. No room in the inn, no room in hearts. Couldn't one person been kind? Couldn't one storekeeper, couldn't one innkeeper make room for the king of kings? You see, they weren't looking for that. I read the other day where that in that day when they had a big gathering in the cities and the towns and all the inns were full, people would come there and drink and revel and be merry of the things in the world. Not much has changed today, has it? You see, for many people, it's them and other things first. It's still that way today. Oh, we've been told that there's a place for everything. Have you ever heard that? There's a place for everything. But what place does Jesus Christ have in our politics? What place does the Son of God have in society? What place does the Savior have in the home or in the hearts? Sad to say, even in some churches. You see, like the end at Bethlehem, they're already full. No room for Jesus in the affairs of people's daily lives. No room for Jesus at the dinner table anymore. No room for Jesus when you rise in the morning to read the Word of God before you send your children out, before you go out into the world. The Word of God says that we need to put His Word before us at all times. We need to teach our children diligently when we rise and when we sit down and when we go to bed My mother would have never let me live, leave the house. Get on that school bus and go to school without feeding me first. And I'm not talking about breakfast. See, my mom would sit the boys around the table. After we got through eating biscuits and gravy, and she'd read the Word of God. She prepared our hearts for the truth or for the world that day by reading us the Word of God. When we sat down at a dinner table, we never ate first. You never picked up a spoon or a fork or a knife. You never touched your plate until Daddy or Mama said grace. And don't think of going to bed until Mama gets through reading the Word of God and Daddy gets through praying. It's not like that today in most churches, most houses, most homes. I've went to sleep on my knees many times as a little boy. You see, we didn't just sit on the couch. We didn't have a couch. We didn't just sit there while Daddy prayed. No, we got on our knees. And but Daddy could pray. Some of y'all may remember hearing him pray for an hour at a time. It's not that way today. You see, Jesus doesn't have a place in everything. I trust that he has a place in your heart. He, predict, he, he talked to Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20 when he says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I trust he's in your heart. I trust that he's there. Let's make much of Jesus. Let's give him room. Right now, let's give him praise in his house. Amen.
we see the proclamation in verses 8 through 12. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Let me just stop right there for a moment. You know, you know the reason we believe in missionary work? Because Christ came as the first missionary to reach all people. Well, there's a doctrine that's corrupt that says only the elect few will go to heaven. Some people was destined, destined for heaven, some predestinated to hell. I want to tell you what, my Savior came to be the Savior of all people. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. It doesn't matter. For unto you this day is, in the city of David is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you that you shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You see, it was only divinely fitting. Listen to this. It was only divinely fitting that Christ the Lord should be heralded her by the angel of the Lord and accompanied by the glory of the Lord. And we have the gospel of incarnation declaring good tidings of great joy. Christ the Lord, announced by the angel of the Lord, accompanied by the glory of the Lord. And we who have the incarnated Christ living within us, God with man, Emmanuel, have the greatest story ever told. We have the best news anyone could ever hear. And there's nothing greater. There's nothing better than the great good tidings of great joy. Good tidings of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Emptying himself into the poverty of fallen man that he might make many rich. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in though that he was rich, yet he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. I don't know anything better than that. That I who was wicked in sin, headed for hell, destined to be in eternal separation from God. The light of the world, born at night, heralded by the angel of the Lord, accompanied by the glory of the Lord, has now, is now residing in the people of the Lord. We who were poor in sin, wretched, undefiled, are now rich in the grace and the righteousness of God. How sad it is today that so many people choose to live, a sinful, live in sinful poverty instead of in rejoice and living in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's alive in your heart, praise him this morning. Amen. Then we notice those who accompanied the coming of Christ. Verse 13 and 14. And suddenly there was a, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. What a story. What an, uh, what, what an accompaniment. I love the song Silent Night, Holy Night. This was not a silent night, by the way. And I personally believe you can't have a silent night in your heart until you first have a rejoicing night. A night of believing. You see, if there was any indifference on earth at the coming of the Son of God, there was no indifference in heaven. 
I read where some famous preacher preached a sermon that said, when Christ left heaven, all the angels cried. I don't find that in the Bible. I don't find that in my Bible. There was rejoicing. You see, God the Son now become the Son of Man that He might redeem fallen man. There was a great rejoicing. Christ says in Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that there likewise shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than ninety and nine just people, persons who need no repentance. Every time somebody gives their heart to Jesus, whether they walk down on a church aisle, whether they sit at home or wherever they're at, and they confess Christ as Lord, they repent of their sins, turn to Him to be their Savior, heaven becomes a noisy place. I believe it was a noisy night, the night of His birth. I believe every time the sinner comes home, it's a noisy place. Every time a sinner comes home and we know about it, this ought to be a noisy place. We ought to shout. We ought to celebrate. We ought to rejoice as they did that night. Oh, how I pray that the indifference to Christ coming to be the Savior of man would just go away and our friends and our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, our uncles, our moms, our dad, yes, and even our enemies would trust Him as their Lord and Savior because He's soon to be the coming King. If that's your desire, to see everybody come to know Jesus, that's why we're here, that's why we exist, that's why we're going to be here until God takes us home. If that's your desire, give Him praise and glory. I want you to notice something about the inquiring shepherds in verse 15 and 16. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the ancient shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even into Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they made haste and came and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Key word in verse 15, which the Lord hath made known. Which the Lord, God, the Father, sent His Son to be born that night in a place where there was no room for Him. I remember when there was no room for Him in my life. You remember that? But he came. And he fills our hearts, fills our lives. But the shepherds believed the word that the Lord had given them through the angelic being and through the rejoicing choir of heaven. Not only did they believe the word, but they acted upon the word and they found Christ just as it was told to them. They didn't reason, try to reason it out. They didn't try to evaluate it. They didn't try to debate it. They didn't say, well, this might be true. This might not be true. He might be there. He might not be there. He might be the Son of God. He might not be the Son of God. It might not, the prophecy might have been worked. The, the prophecy might not have been right. No. They heard about the Savior from God Himself, and they went. They believed and went, and they found him. Can I just bust the bubble of some people, that, some preachers that think they're everything? You see, as many times as I've preached in my last 40 some years of preaching, I have never saved one soul. Not one person has ever got saved because they believed on me and what I said. They believed the Word. You see, it doesn't say that we are saved by the incorruptible teaching of Stanley Waddell or Pastor so-and-so or Preacher so-and-so or Bishop so-and-so or Pope so-and-so or Priest so-and-so. No, it says we are saved by the incorruptible Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 
And if you're saved, it's because you believe the word and you acted upon the word. If Jesus lives in your heart, it's because of the word, not because of some preacher. The angels, I mean the shepherds, said, let's go see. And everybody went. You see, I believe they believed God so much that they didn't worry about the sheep they left in the field. You see, if God could send an angel to, 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 to declare the Son of Man was being born that night, and He could fill the heavens with the host of angelic beings praising and worshiping the Son of God that was born that night, I believe those shepherds looked around and said, well, He can take care of my sheep. They can stay right here. Maybe we ought to be like the shepherds. Let's just believe the Word of God and act on it. You see, I find that happening in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 to the jailer. And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. He believed. He acted. Notice the testimony of the shepherds. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning the child. The shepherds believed, they acted, and they spoke. They told. You see, those who have proved the power of God's word and his revealed truth in their lives are better able to speak about it than any others. You see, if God has saved you, you know it, and you can tell everybody else about it. You say, preacher, I don't know how to tell people about it. Just tell them what happened. Amen. You say, preacher, I can't remember. I can't memorize the Romans road. I can't remember bring all these back to my mind. I have. I can't. I, just tell them what happened. Amen. Just share with them what happened. Oh, I could hear them shepherds going back. You know, that angel, he told me the truth. On their way back to the fields, they passed by other shepherds, they passed by other flocks, and they were busy saying, hey, do you know, you know who we saw tonight in Bethlehem? We saw the Savior of the world. We saw God incarnated in human flesh. We saw God being made flesh. He'd come and dwell among us. Amen. Oh, are you kidding me? No, it's seri I'm serious. It, it did. It happened. Just like the angel said. Amen. If it happens to you, you're better, off, better than anybody else to tell the story which Paul writes to young Timothy and says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I cheat. I never will forget. And I pray I never get over it. The night that I got saved, God had been dealing with me for a long time. Cola Baptist Church, sitting with my mom and dad and brothers on the third seat back on the right. Paul Phipps, a man that was six, 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 seven, could palm a basketball in his hand, but had a heart as gentle and full of compassion was preaching a message. I couldn't wait till he finished. I could not wait till he said the amen and the invitation. Matter of fact, I couldn't wait till the invitation. About three fourths way through his sermon, I found myself on an altar, and E. W. Calloway with his arm around my neck saying, "Stanley, you want to get saved." while Paul was preaching. God gloriously changed my life. 
I went to school the next day. First thing I done was looked at Ms. Norris and said, Ms. Norris, you know what happened to me yesterday, last night? No, Stanley, what happened? I got saved. She knew what I was talking about. She patted me on the head. Now I just live for God. I told my friends, I told my buddies, I told everybody on the, on the school bus. Y'all remember when safety patrols were on the school bus? I was a safety patrol, so that means I got to stand up while everybody else was sitting down, and I had that little white belt across my shoulder, around my waist. I said, listen, folks, I got saved last night. I told everybody. I'm going to tell you something. I'm still telling the same story. It never gets old. What kind of testimony do we have? Who are we speaking about? Who are we talking about? Let's give him praise and glory for a lasting testimony in the lives of believers. Amen. And we see the rejoicing. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for the, all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Maybe we should question whether or not we've been, or whether or not we've ever found Jesus if the Lord gives us no glory or if we have no glory in speaking of Him and telling others about Him. If the gospel is not glad tidings of great joy to you, then maybe you need to find out whether you know Him or not. Shouldn't we not be as the shepherds? They heard, they believed, they obeyed, they received, they testified, they rejoiced, they praised God, and they returned glorifying and praising God and spreading the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. An old songwriter, hundreds of years ago, penned this down. Oh, prestigious wonder, to be sounded like by the thunder, our God on earth a child, but as the light not lightning, attracting not a frightening, earth and heaven reconciled. O infinite of grace, that our dearest terrors chase, our God on earth a child, mystery of mysteries, coming not to live but to die, God's own Son, undefiled I trust that you know the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ I trust that he is placed in your heart in your life I trust that you celebrate his birth every day and you tell others about him every time you have a chance that's the true Christmas story God became flesh, dwelt among us. And we get to enjoy his glory. Heads bowed and eyes closed as Jack and the ladies come. I'm going to ask Jack to lead a couple of verses of song of the invitation. If God has touched your heart, maybe you need to come and thank him. Maybe you need to come and confess him. Maybe you need to be saved today. Maybe you just need to come and rejoice at His being your Savior. Heavenly Father, take this message, the Christmas story, use it in the hearts of believers to rejoice, to be thankful. Use it in the hearts of unbelievers to become believers. That we might fulfill your coming into this world by us being the light of the world that they might see the good tidings of great joy of the grace of God in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Brother Jack.